Hello everyone and welcome to the Growing Lentils in 2019 webinar. My name is Prue Cook, I work with the Birch of Cropping Group and I coordinate the GRDC funded Southern Pulse Extension Project. This project is delivered by a consortium of researchers, agronomists, farming systems groups, growers and pulse experts to increase the knowledge of growers and advisors on sustainable pulse production, improving the southern region's capacity to maximise future growth and profitability opportunities. The purpose of today's webinar is to give new and existing lentil growers a snappy overview of what to consider this season to best set you up for success. Now before we start the presentation, uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping items in relation to using the webinar software. I've muted everyone's microphones, so please keep yourself on mute so that there's no background noise that might distract the presenters. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end of today's session, but please feel free to submit questions at any time. You can do this by clicking on, you should see a speech bubble icon. It should be at the bottom of your screen, but it might look different depending on the device that you're accessing this webinar on today. If you hit that, a text box will appear and you'll be able to type in a question and from there you can either send that through to myself if you want it to be anonymous or you can send it to everyone and um, it can be answered publicly. Now this webinar is being recorded. If you can't stay for the entire thing or if you have any technical issues or if you'd like to share this, um, then the recordings will be made available on the GRDC website next week but you can also flick me an email or give me a call. My contact details will be at the end of the webinar and we can get you a copy of the recording a little bit earlier if you would like. Now just to quickly help our presenters, I've got two quick questions that I'd like to ask you to get a gauge on who's joining us today. Now hopefully you should see popping up on your screen some questions that you should be able to click and answer. If you can't see them, you get to take a little break for now. Uh, but it's just two questions asking your experience with lentil growing and where you're dialing in from today. So I'll just give you a quick moment to have a look at that and answer those questions. We've got some agronomists joining us today. Um, got some from the Lower EP York and Mid North. We've got a few from the miscellaneous category. We've got some high rainfall zone growers from Southern Vic or SA. A few more agronomists. And a couple people who either can't see the question or aren't wanting to participate. I'll give you a few more moments and then what we'll do, I'll just share the screen and we can start straight into our presentation for today. <coughs> Okay, now I'm going to introduce you all for our first presentation is Dr. Jason Brand who is with Agriculture Victoria and he's based in Horsham. Jason heads up the GRDC Southern Pulse Agronomy Program and has over 20 years experience in the pulse industry. Over to you Jason, I'll just turn your microphone on and Jason will provide us all with an agronomy update. Are you there, Jason? Just having a little bit of trouble with Jason's audio right now. Are you there, Jason? All right, what we might do is we might skip forward while we sort out Jason's audio issue, is we might skip forward and go on to our next presenter, who is, uh, unless Jason, unless you're there now. No? Okay. Jason, we'll try and sort out your audio. And Navneet, we'll just make sure that we've got your audio. Are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Yes, you are there. Excellent. 
Uh, just let me quickly progress through your slides and we will just revise the order ever so slightly and we'll come back to Jason a little bit later. All right, so Dr. Navneet Agarwal is joins us from Saudi today and his research centres on improving weed management in high intensity break crop farming systems. And today he's going to give us an update on controlling ryegrass in lentils. Navneet, over to you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Pru. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I am, it is my pleasure. Navneet, yeah. can I just interrupt for a moment? You're very, very quiet. Can I ask you to speak very loudly and very close to your microphone, please? Okay, yes. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today it is my pleasure to share my research experiences with you regarding ryegrass resistance and its management in high break crop intensity rotations, including lentils. First of all, I would like to thank GRDC and SARDI for jointly funding this research work. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, my talk today will be focused on, uh, previous slide, please. Previous slide, please, Prue. Uh, previous, previous, the, the previous slide to, yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, today my talk will be focused on where we are heading for controlling ryegrass in high break crop intensity rotations. And secondly, what are the potential options for controlling ryegrass in break crops? I will extend this information based on my results from the research trials on lentils. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, as we all know that there has been a significant increase in area under break crops, including canola and pulses in South Australia in the last one and a half decade, as is shown in this graph. Uh, this has resulted from improved agronomic practices, higher harvest efficiency, availability of new herbicide tolerant varieties like TT canola, clear field canola, and XT lentils, and higher pulse prices. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in particular, like the combination of XT lentil varieties and its high market price, have become appealing to many South Australian growers with a record 185,000 hectares area sown to lentils in 2019, and which was almost double than what was five years ago in 2012. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, this change in cropping system has raised new industry challenges for us. Uh, heavy reliance on Group A chemistry, which includes clethodim in particular, in break crops has contributed to increased ryegrass resistance to these Group A herbicides. Consequently, herbicides with different modes of actions, which includes herbicides from Group D, Js, and Ks, are used to manage dim resistant ryegrass in break crops. Uh, therefore, there is a need for careful management of these alternate pre-emergent herbicides to minimize selection for resistant buildup to any single mode of action in high break crop intensity rotations. Uh, next slide, please. To have better understanding of resistance in ryegrass in high break crop rotations, a focus paddock survey was initiated in 2019. Uh, in that survey, a total of 45 paddocks were selected across different regions of South Australia. And these selected paddocks had either, either at least two emi-tolerant break crops such as PBA hurricane XT lentil or clearfield canola in the last five years, or the paddocks had two non-emi break crops uh, from conventional lentils, conventional canola, TT canola, field peas, chickpeas, faba beans, or lupins in the last five years. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the results of herbicide resistance screening from these focus paddocks. Uh, here, blue bars represent confirmed resistance, and green bars represent uh, ryegrass population with developing resistance. 
as this graph shows rye grass was found to be resistant to sulfonylureas and dense in almost all the paddocks uh, further high level of resistance to intervix and trifluralin was also recorded in rye grass populations but the key concern is that a total of 46% of rye grass populations were confirmed resistant and another 21% popula populations were developing resistant to clethodim in these high break crop intensity paddocks such resistance levels limits the effectiveness of break crops as useful rotational tools in our systems next slide please further uh, this graph shows that one quarter of the ryegrass populations were resistant to box of gold and one third populations were found to have started developing resistant to another important herbicide secura in these systems the only positive outcome was that all the ryegrass populations were sensitive to group d propizamide next slide please so when i look back into the history of herbicide usage in those paddocks the rank first paddock in resistance to group j and k herbicides had two times boxer gold and three times secura used in the last 5 years and the second rank paddock in resistance had three times boxer gold and one time secura used in last three years itself so this is the scale of those group and j herbicides being used in those high intensity break crop systems which is really concerning in the net shell uh, i would say that the concerns for rye grass control have now not limited to group a and group b herbicides in break crops resistance development in rye grass to boxer gold and secura is even more concerning for sustaining these pre emergent chemistries in our high break crop intensity systems including lentils next slide please next please sorry now i would like to discuss results from research trials conducting during last 2 years for rye grass management in lentils next slide please next slide please uh, in 2017 two research previous slide please previous yeah in 2017 two research trials were conducted at hart in mid north and maitland in york peninsula investigating potential new herbicide altro with active ingredient carbetamide and this herbicide is a adama product and belongs to new group e and is currently in development so the results showed that altro provided similar level of rye grass control as achieved with propizamide secura and boxer gold and further altro provided 98% reduction in rye grass seed set over unweeded control at both the sides uh, further i would like to mention that uh, in both the trials uh, i had pba hurricane xt lentil variety uh, at both the locations next slide please Similarly in 2018 at Hart Altro proved as effective as propizamide for controlling ryegrass in lentils Next slide please Next slide please Yes uh, this is a very interesting slide in the second research trial at Maitland in 2018 Altro proved to be the best herbicide for ryegrass control followed by propizamide however boxer gold and secura did not control ryegrass effectively and were not different to unweeded control for ryegrass uh, ryegrass seed set as shown in this graph this trial site paddock was the second worst paddock for resistance to group j and k herbicides in my focus paddock survey as discussed earlier so this illustrates that 
the magnitude of impact can result from the loss of these important herbicides boxagold and secura in lentils due to resistance build up in rye grass next slide please so uh, at the end i would like to conclude that it is confirmed that uh, resistance to in addition to resistance in dim chemistry herbicides ryegrass has started developing resistance to group j and k herbicides in high break crop intensity systems and expected registration of ultro in 2020 will make it an important tool along with group d propizamide for controlling ryegrass in break crop phase especially lentils and we need to make it sure that rotating modes of actions uh, which we use in high intensity break crop rotations we need to rotate those herbicides to delay the herbicide resistance build up and especially we need to use group d propizamide in break crop phase and save group j and k's for cereal crop phase at the end i would like to thank all the participants for listening to my presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Navneet, and my apologies for my poor driving at the beginning of your presentation there. It was a bit crazy in the control room with some audio issues and my phone and other bits and pieces, so thank you for putting up with that there. Now, Jason, we're going to try for you again. Can we hear you this time? Can you hear me this time? Yes, we can, Jason. That's fantastic. Sorry about that, and I've got no idea why I decided to dump out. So. Do you know what? I'll take full responsibility for it and say it was my fault, Jason. But yeah, let's... I, I wouldn't do that, so that's all right. <laughs> all right. Straight up. Oops, oops, what have I done? I've done the wrong thing. Okay. Straight up to you anyway. Okay. We'll take a couple of steps back and just look at a bit of an overview of the season. Um, the opening slide when we get there, we're going to just show you a bit of an overview of some of the trial work that we were running up uh, in the Mallee. So the trial site up at Odeon last year. Um, we'll go back to that opening slide because that's a nice one. Because um, it highlights, uh, you got the one before that, Prue? Are we jumping too fast? Are you still with us? Yes, keep going back. Okay, we'll start here. Um, okay, we keep jumping. All right. Um, well, anyway, the first slide we we're just talking about is we're showing some trials, and, and there's a particular interest, obviously, as we move up into the Mallee to see how we can better produce lentils across sandy soils. And the image on that original first slide was uh, just looking at uh, an overview of the site and then some trials that we're running on sand hills where. We're looking at a whole range of options from herbicides through to nutrition um, and even potentially amendments working uh, with Michael Moody up there at OEM. Um, and that plot you can see uh, in the foreground here is actually uh, one of the new potential lines being tested and really highlights uh, where lentils have gone to and that canned ability they have and that ability to grow um, in uh, Mallee type conditions. Next slide, please. So in review, 2018 uh, probably can be summarised in a couple of words, uh, dry and frost for us, uh, certainly in Victoria, but uh, across a lot, of, uh, a lot of southern Australia. There were some good patches, obviously, um, but the, pretty much the summary here in Victoria was dry and frost. So the photos on the left-hand side there are actually from the Wimra, um, some high-value ground down in the Wimra, and that is what our lentils look like and uh, reflect on the yields in just a moment. And then over on the uh, right hand side of the slide, we're just uh, highlighting some of the frost issues and I've got some chickpeas in the photo there, but um, obviously the, the frost damage seed to the lentils down the bottom there. And you know, this was from up at Oyen and you know, we were dealing with 80, 90% frost damage in many of the trials. One of the key things that came out of the frost work that was really, really interesting in that photo there, you can see two lines. And um, on the left there, you can see a line with um, that real yellowing you get from the vegetative frost damage, similar to what we've seen in PBA Hurricane uh, many times over the last few years. 
Uh, and there were some questions going around in industry. Is that related to the any tolerance trait, to that particular uh, transformation event that um, uh, is being utilised to uh, provide us with any tolerance? Well, the two lines you've got there both have any tolerance in them. As you can see on the right hand side, the line that we've got there is showing pretty much no vegetative damage from frost. I'm not sure the actual impact of vegetative frost is, is actually huge on yield, but um, certainly uh, looks a lot better, at least when your plants remain green after a frost event during the vegetative phase. So, um, but despite that, yeah, there was a, a huge amount of frost damage. Next slide, please. So just a quick snapshot of the season. Lower yields uh, generally across the board for us. So to give you an idea, the Victorian yields, uh, Oyen and Cario in that 0 0.1, 0 0.2 up to 0.5 range and Horsham 0.2 to 0.6. So nothing really exciting to speak of. Uh, low, lower prices, obviously. Uh, everyone knows where we sat there. Prices did jump up a bit uh, through um, December and January. And so there were the occasional good catch on prices, uh, but certainly um, the overall trend was on the lower end of lentil prices. We were generally below the long-term average for prices. Uh, low disease pressure throughout the industry, um, something we've always got to maintain and watch, but generally low disease pressure, but also growers are doing a great job in terms of managing at this point in time. And obviously due to the frost events, uh, poorer grain quality. Although again, um, it's amazing how well things got cleaned up with seed cleaners and also in the harvesting operations. So <clears throat> even if you see a sample like we've got there, um, which I think we estimated to be about 50% frost damage, we were able to bring that back to about a 5 or 10% frost damage just through um, simple cleaning um, equipment. So, so yeah, um, it was a really good effort by the industry to clean up what we did have. Let's uh, move on to the next slide. So I'd just like to highlight this um, and just to remind ourselves of um, what the value of some of these crops are over the longer term. And this is just based on our Mallee site, so it doesn't include the Wimmera. And so the lentil numbers would be much higher again if we looked at um, lentils in the Wimmera uh, long term. So it's just a reminder that obviously there's a huge variation from year to year based on price and yield. And um, so the figures you see here are based on uh, the prices received in December, January of the year the crop's grown and based on the average yield of that site. Not, not based on the highest yielding variety, but on the average yield of that site in that particular year. And Cario is our low rainfall or medium, low medium rainfall zone site and Owen's a bit lower than Cario. And so obviously highlighting the variation we've got over the years. Um, and last year was the only negative year we've really had in terms of growth margin on lentils in that time period we've been up there. So just a reminder of that, if we just flick on to the next uh, click, and if you look at the long-term averages there, so lentils and chickpeas stack up rather well in terms of the economics. Because um, sometimes, yeah, we tend to just remember the last couple of years and uh, or remember some of the issues that we might have had in just even just in last year and um, forget about the longer term story um, and how well we've done out of these pulses in the longer term. Move on to the next one, please. So in terms of new varieties, uh, we have PBA Hallmark. Um, this uh, will be a really good replacement for PBA Hurricane. Uh, fits into that medium seed size category, has the same tolerance to group B herbicides, but with improved vigour and botrytis grey mould resistance. So certainly has a good fit there and some improvements in terms of tolerance to soil types. So may even provide additional benefits in some of the Mallee soil types where we run into boron and salt issues. And overall higher yields, so higher than Hurricane, less than Jumbo 2 but uh, certainly a great replacement in terms of the uh, any tolerance coming through. And um, the photo down here, sorry, that's not meant to say PBA Jumbo to at the top there, that's just an any herbicide applied across those two, uh, two plots. And obviously you can see the damage there in Jumbo 2 compared to Hallmark in a season like last year, um, just highlighting the differences that we're gonna have. So let's move on to the next slide. 
So a variety of opportunities. Uh, I just wanted to bring this one forward because this actually highlights Hallmark as well. So if you look towards the left-hand side of the graph there, this is some um, longer-term Mallee grain yields across Oyun and Cario for 2016 to 18. So it encompasses a wet year, an incredible drought, and something somewhere in between. So uh, quite a variation there, and you can sort of see where Hallmark sits out in terms of the percentage of the site mean doing um, really well compared to other varieties and also highlights the opportunities that there are with breeding lines coming through with that CPL 1504 coming out at the top of the chart there. Move the next slide please. So moving on to 2019 considerations and obviously we're going to highlight disease uh, because if it does rain we're going to get it again. Uh, so if we start over on the right hand side with the Tritus spray moles Obviously, variety selection can come in pretty important there, so you can get some quite big differences between the varieties. Jumbo 2, which has got uh, full resistance to petritus grey mould as compared to a bolt, but that doesn't mean the disease can't be controlled. Uh, so there's some really good uh, strategies out there now, utilising carbendism and other products uh, to control petritus grey mould, and happy to chat about that later on. Obviously, Aspicida blight, but again, most of our varieties these days have um, a reasonable level of Aspicida blight. The key thing that we want to message out to industry there is to keep an eye on what's going on. So have a look at the varieties out there, and um, if it is a resistant or a moderately resistant variety and you're seeing too much Aspicida blight in there, make sure it's being reported back to uh, the state body. So here in Victoria, obviously uh, with us in Agriculture Victoria and Josh Fanning, and then in South Australia through uh, Jenny Davidson and her team there at SARDI. So it's about watching what's happening with Aspicida blight because um, we are seeing some changes obviously with the varieties out there. And I just wanted to touch on, uh, we do occasionally see Sperotinia in those high disease, high disease years. Next slide please. So herbicide damage, uh, in some regions uh, this will be more relevant than others. So if we've had a dry summer, um, particularly some of your carryovers from group I, group B type chemistry, particularly group Bs if you're not growing any tolerant her um, lentils like Hallmark or Hurricane. Uh, group I's, uh, certainly seen that many times, um, particularly in the Mallee environment. I remember going through some of those drought years where two and three years afterwards we were seeing uh, group I residue damage in lentils. So I know many people are well aware of these issues, but it's worthwhile reminding ourselves and looking back in the paddock history. Uh, you know, and even us in trial work, we came unstuck last year in a paddock where um, we've been told that group I's weren't a major issue. Um, but then when all the records came out, we found out that they were a bit more of a major issue and, and certainly a yield limiting factor for us, even in the Wimmera last year. And then obviously group C damage, uh, particularly around the post zone pre-immersion or IBS applications. Uh, it's an ongoing issue with lentils, so it's all about sowing depth, placement, all those sort of issues. Uh, at the moment, obviously, we don't have um, significant levels of tolerance to group C chemistry. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing I haven't touched on in terms of 2019 uh, considerations obviously is price and uh, just being aware of the price. Um, Janine might be able to comment on that in as part of her presentation uh, coming up. So like all pulses, paddock selection and management are absolutely critical to growing successful lentils. Uh, where possible, growing them into a paddock where there is retained stubble, they do benefit from uh, ret uh, retained residue and in particular standing residue, uh, improving harvestability but also improving yields. We've got data going back several years which indicate you know growing into stubble versus burnt stubble can potentially result in yields uh, increased by 20% or more particularly in lentils and that's not including the harvestability uh, benefits you get from standing residue. So paddock selection is critical knowing your background history in terms of herbicides uh, and then your soil types, uh, understanding your soil types and then potentially what varieties might fit into that. 
So that leads naturally on into variety choice and what you're trying to achieve. So obviously if uh, group B or any chemistry has been in the background of that paddock, it's probably going to be a good idea to stick to your uh, group B of tolerant lentils or your intolerant lentils like your hallmarks and hurricanes. And uh, But obviously getting into some of the more high disease risk areas, Jumbo 2 uh, fits strongly into that. Um, and But then if you're confident in terms of controlling disease and it's a lower risk, PBA Bolt has a strong fit in some of the more mixed soil types. Um, and ACE has a fit in certain regions. We certainly see some benefits on some of the acid soils. So, yeah, there are, um, it's worthwhile thinking through variety choice very carefully um, before you jump into growing lentils. Uh, obviously, starting out the season, have your disease strategies in place before the season. Really important to make sure that those fungicides are locked in. Uh, before we start the season, you've got the product on hand. Because the last thing we want is to get canopy closure. You're wanting to put out a spray to control, try to spray mould and you can't get product uh, because you know there's no supply in Australia and we have run into those issues in the past so just keep that in mind. <clears throat> Obviously pre-emergent herbicides we've touched on previously. Seeding rates, uh, the longer term lesson there is that um, with some of these newer varieties like your Jumbo 2s and that that are more bulky, more vigorous, we can get away with slightly lower seeding rates particularly on the wider row spacing. So when we're out at 12 and 15 inch row spacings, which a lot of growers actually are operating on in Victoria now, um, dropping back to in, in that 80 to 100 plants per square metre, um, certainly we haven't seen too many yield losses. It's when you get below 80 plants that you start to see a bit more of a drop off in terms of um, yields. And uh, inoculants and nutrition. So. Look, we know a lot of growers don't always inoculate, but if we're going to grow lentils in a new area where we haven't grown them before, on sandy soils, or even starting to push on some of the more marginal acidic soils, then these things are absolutely critical and nutrition goes alongside with that. Ultimately, um, working alongside a good agronomist is um, essential for a lentil crop. So I'd really encourage uh, growers to be uh, yeah, getting in touch with their local agronomists and working closely with them and um, learning what works in their regions because it's very hard to sort of sit here and talk um, broadly. We can give you the real broad um, ideas, but um, there are tweaks for each region and that's where the agronomists come in um, and then I'm always open for a phone call. I love learning about other parts of the industry. So um, that will help me. Thank you very much, Ruth. Thank you, David. Very much appreciated. Now we'll move on to our very last presenter for today. And next we have Janine Sowness. Janine is the commercial manager at PBC near Horsham, and PBC specialises in the production of seed and grain processing and packaging through to marketing seed and grain both domestically and internationally. Janine, I'll turn your microphone on. Also, I think I'm experiencing a significant lag between you, uh, between me hitting the next slide button and it appearing on the screen. So just give me a couple of seconds for the next slide to pop up and hopefully uh, that should all work. Are you there, Janine? Yes. Um, is, is my mute off? Hello? Yes, you're good to go. Good to go? Hello, Bruce. Okay. okay. We'll just there we go. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, just before I start, I just might follow on a little bit from Jason, um, having mentioned about the new Hallmark XT lentil. Just a bit of a quick update on seed supply. Um, there was we had significant seed crops across New South Wales, Mallee, Wimmera, um, and in South Australia as well. But obviously, it was a bit of a challenging year for seed production, but. Overall, we're re with frost at the end. Um, we're reasonably happy we have a good supply to suit um, everybody's needs. Um, but there was, we're just managing a bit of juggle with uh, a number of stores that do cover orders and just confirming final quantities. So we thought we were sold out in January, but then we were right in February and perhaps we're down to about 5-10% uh, of supply left. So if there's anyone who's still interested in um, that particular variety, there's potentially a little bit of seed left. Um, they look, may look to um, do orders fairly soon um, as we're working through the list and dispatching at the moment. So I just thought I'd give you a quick update on that one. 
um, to the minute. And um, yeah, so we'll move forward into um, talking about uh, where the market's at and just a bit of a background. Uh, so I'll just touch a bit more on, as Jason's mentioned, um, our current situation in Australia with our lentil production um, supply. Um, if you look, I put a, um, I've, on the um, slide there, there's a graph of the last couple of decades of how the Australian lentil area has grown, um, particularly um, in the last, say, five years with the introduction of the new PBA lentil varieties, which has um, enabled the expansion into a, um, new, a range of areas and high prices certain dro certainly drove the uptake of lentils um, from the sort of 2014-15 to nearly to double the area um, in 2017 with the high prices got everyone excited. Um, we've certainly dropped back a bit this year um, to 265,000 hectares, but it's still the third largest area for Australia. So we've still got a significant area of growing to lentils, an important crop in our um, region. Um, but certainly the production will be down um, going to market this year um, with generally low yields. Um, so I'm mean, just sort of put perhaps an estimate of 1.2 tonne per hectare overall, um, looking at a bit over 300,000 tonne. Potentially um, supply, um, there's sort of various guesses around, but um, that's sort of a, my rough idea. And it's always a bit hard to know exactly what's on farm in terms of old season tonnes, because certainly a crop that people will store for good reason when the prices are low. So um, there's only guesstimates about what might be there, but even if, um, I mean, it's probably immaterial until people sell it as to um, how important that quantity is um, when they're prepared to sell it. Okay, so next slide, please, Prue. So just looking ahead to, I guess, the world situation, which certainly um, is strong, into strong effects on uh, pricing and demand. Um, we've seen in, I mean, Canada's our big competitor with red lentils, um, producing very large quantities and having a big impact on the market. Um, and they've actually had fairly strong exports over their winter period because they've, they've got, from the previous few years, they've certainly um, stored a lot, um, had a lot of stockpile. So um, in the same sort of situation, they've produced a lot. People have, their production's gone up as prices went up a few years ago and they've got a bit of surplus to move and they've certainly been actually moving a bit over, over their winter months um, and uh, into the market. The US has been a bit slower, Australia has certainly been a bit slower, people are not prepared to sell um, and our, the percentage of exports going out of lentils from Australia has been a lower percentage than perhaps we would, we've seen in, in the past from the sort of October to January period. Um, whether we're down at about um, you know, just a small percentage, whether it's 20% or depending what the total volume is at the end, whereas sometimes at this time of year we're anywhere between 30, 40 plus percent of exports have happened. So obviously people don't want to sell and that's fair enough. So um, we'll, um, we'll move on to the next slide, please, Prue. Yes, yeah, so um, with our sort of low prices at harvest, um, we didn't know where that was going to go, but there was some upward movement um, coming into January. And um, it was interesting just talking to growers that were, you know, finding out the prices were at and when they're at 500, they're saying, no, I won't sell, maybe wait till 600, I might sell. But when they got to 600, growers said, oh, no, I'll wait till it goes to 700, but never did. So it dropped back down. Um, just, you know, the market is what the market is. It wasn't prepared to meet that those sort of prices. And um, so growers were per, um, happy to store for a while. Um, in, those, in those periods, we... Um, saw that um, the jumbo type was at, often sitting at a premium, $20, $40 or so, um, above the medium-sized lentil, just the variety that was selling and uh, was required. Um, and then again, there was another, pre that the small lentils were at a discount to that, down on that as well. They were sort of maybe $80, $100 off the jumbo type um, in terms of what was um, being offered at the time um, over the past few months. Um, so uh, we certainly have a lot of product stored, um, some's moved, uh, the market's just very slow, there's not really much happening. Um, there is, I guess, anything that is happening where, there were, where we've had, 
had we have had frost events causing some you know high damage as J Jason mentioned in some areas of um, you know maybe up to 30 percent effective with frosted um, so very poor quality lentils and I guess there've been there's some currently selling for stock feed maybe around the 420 mark uh, has been up to 450 per ton um, but this is really it's not a typical situation that we'll get these sort of prices for stock feed lentils. Often it's a bit lower in other years, um, but because we've been underpinned by this higher stock feed market, I mean, really we've got cereals being sold for about 400 or so uh, for stock feed as well. So that's they're pretty, pretty. I guess it worked in fairly well um, for um, those sort of quality lentils that aren't normally um, going to export that they've been able to have a market to go to. Okay, next slide, please, Prue. So just thinking about, um, you know, if you're storing, you, you know, you've got new season lentils, old season lentils sitting from previous year or years, um, just be thinking about um, they're going to be perhaps in quality storage, silo storage, keep them in good condition. Um, if there's some product in silo bags, perhaps that's not much of a long-term option, um, whether they can keep the quality right or not. Uh, just got to think about those considerations. Um, and when we're going... If we're not sure when we're going to the market, we never know, don't have a crystal ball to say what the market's going to do and um, think about when we do market it, we've got the, the lentils do slowly start to turn colour um, over time, um, which is a, just a, a visual indicator to the market that, uh, well, what's, how do, what are the quality of these lentils going to be? So visually, you know, your fresh season off the header looks really um, a nice, clean, bright, uh, lighter brown colour um, and after about six months they start they just start to turn a little bit sort of that six to twelve months um, they come more in line with the product that's you know up to maybe two and a half years old that and when they start getting a bit over two and a half years old they really there's, there's another some sort of significant change in their colour so it's just thinking about if you're marketing old and new season um, not mixing them together and um, perhaps marketing them as a separate parcel because um, really it's about how the market will, how they present to the market in its appearance. And at the end of the day, the red lentils are milled and um, it comes to, can come down to how uniform they split. So if you've got new season, old season, you'll have different properties in terms of split, splitability um, occurring. So that's why the market would like it separate um, to go into the mills. Um, and just dealing with off-grade lentils, um, just... Um, Jason indicated before, you know, there's potential for cleaning um, up to a, potentially up to higher grades, um, depending how much frost you can get out if there was frosted quality in there. Um, if it was 30% and it only got to 10, it might not make much of a difference into a market, but if it got it up to 5% or under, it might make more of a difference in terms of finding a better market than a 10% off grade. Um, so just need to investigate for those sort of products, whether there is cleaning options that will improve it significantly or not, um, and you know how where a market option might be or how long you might have to store it to make that make a higher quality grade. Okay, next slide, please, Prue. So, in the global terms, where the market's going to go, it's on everyone's chatter. It's talked about a lot. What's happening in India? What's going to happen? I think it's months and months of chatter and speculation and um, because it is a very important market. Um, it is the second largest country in the world population wise and their key uh, food item is pulses, so including a large amount of lentils, which are, so I put those pictures on the side. Um, lentil dals is a key food they eat every day. And, um, but it's a, it's a large population, it also produces um, reasonable quantity themselves. Um, but we, over the years, have sent um, sent a lot of our product to that market. And then, so at the moment, politics is getting in the way. Um, some time ago, they, um, the Indian country had imported a lot of lentils and had huge stocks. And um, in the end, they uh, imposed some tariffs to reduce the quantities coming in and protect the local local farmers from a lot of imports coming in, high quality imports. Um, 
And so that sort of put up a bit of a barrier in terms of our price into those markets and continue our, you know, a bit of uncertainty in our exports to that country. So it's all just on hold, it seems like it's all just on hold until so this, uh, the government election, which happens in late May, and to the government, the local farmer vote is very important. So they don't want to upset the farmers before the election. Um, um, so there's it'll almost be a bit of a hold this space until that happens and clears. Everyone's wanting that to happen and be done with. And, but who knows what happened, how long it might take after the election for things to change. But at the end of the day, um, the ball's got it, the considerations will start coming into play that um, do they need to keep there are buyers who say, well, we're going to start needing to book some lentils and buy some. But when, because um, price is king, um, the harvest will happen sort of, sort of April, May. The area production is area is a little bit down. There's speculation about their production. Is there drought effects or not? Or uh, what are their supply stocks at? So there's many different factors that are sort of all in the air at the moment. Um, so it's a bit of a hold this space for where the market's going to go until um, all these um, things come to light. Um, but at the end of the day, as I said, the people still need to eat lentils and other pulses. Um, but it's at what point the um, buyers say, well, we're going to be running short of product or we need to buy money, buy things in and uh, uh, whether the market will turn then. It's, time will tell. Uh, so next slide, please. So just lastly, I just thought I'd... Um, uh, just put up a 10-year just price lentil price trend. It's just a bit of an idea um, that, as in all pulse um, markets, uh, products that uh, the dollars work in cycles, and it's just how long the cycle takes. And so this gives you an idea that we always say, well, what goes down must come up, and then must go down again. Um, and same with growers production. When the prices were going up, everyone produced increased area here and in Canada, the US. Um, in response to high prices, and then the next year they drop down again. So production drops, and uh, the supply and demand cycle continues. So um, I guess at the moment, I guess the, the closing comment would be, well, we've been we're at the down of the cycle, so at some stage it will go up. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. So thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Janine. That's fantastic. All right, guys, uh, we'll now move into the Q&A component of today. So this is the opportunity, if you would like, you can type in a question. So if you run your mouse over your screen, hopefully you'll see a speech bubble icon pop up somewhere. Um, if you hit that, a chat box will appear, and then you can type a message in to Navneet, Jason, or Janine. Um, so I'll give you a few moments to run through that. If you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in. We don't have any at this stage. Um, but while you're thinking about questions to ask and getting them in, if you're looking for further information on Lentos, then GRDC Grow Notes are an incredibly comprehensive resource that you can access through the GRDC website. Um, also, the GRDC Southern Pulse Extension Project, which this webinar is a part of, um, has a number of activities occurring throughout 2019, which will continue to bring you the latest in Pulse information. One of our key activities is that we have a network of discussion groups across Victoria and SA, which is targeted at new, new or newer Pulse growers. Um, now, those locations are on the screen. If you're near one of these locations and you'd like to get involved, click me an email. My contact details will be at the end of the webinar and I can get you in touch with the group coordinator. We'll also be having crop walks at Southern Pulse Agronomy Trial Sites. So that's the uh, trials that Jason was discussing earlier on. And they'll be happening right across the region in late winter and earlier spring. So keep an eye out for those activities. And also, this is the fourth webinar that we've, we've run this week. Uh, it's the one with the most technical difficulties, so I apologise for that. We have one to go, which is chickpeas, which will be happening at 12 o'clock 
Victorian time today, so that's 11.30 for people in SA. Um, if you would like to access webinars for uh, the recordings of the webinars that we've run previously, so that's for Faber Beans, Vetch and Field Peas, please let me know and we can get you in touch with those. And please feel free to join in with the Chickpea webinar which will be happening after this one. But if you've liked today's event and you don't mind the webinar format, please feel free to suggest other Pulse topics that you might like covered in greater depth later on in the growing season and we might look at rolling some out for, throughout the year. I haven't seen any questions come in at this stage and looking at the time, uh, we might wrap it up there, but please if you have any other suggestions or requests for things that you'd like to learn about, if you have any questions that you think of later, please let me know and I can touch base with our experts today. Um, but what we'll do is wrap it up there Thank you very much to all our presenters, uh, phenomenal presentations today, and thank you very much to all of you for participating. I hope you all grow some magnificent lentils this season. Thank you very much.